Today we're going to be reviewing the BMW 330i. Now in this video we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this vehicle to see what's inside and how it works. And we're going to start under the hood here where we have BMW's B48 2 liter 4 cylinder turbocharged engine. It's situated longitudinally for a rear wheel drive layout and it's made it to an 8 speed automatic transmission down below. Now taking a look at how this engine is set up here you can see it's slightly slanted off to the passenger side here. The air is going to begin its journey from this air filter box to this resonator and then straight down into the turbocharger which is on the exhaust side of the engine over here. There's no intercooler so that air is going straight over to the throttle body and then into the air intake plenum over here and then into the engine to get burned. Now removing the air filter on one of these isn't too difficult. You just have to snap off some of these clips here. This side. And remove this top here. And then this here is your air filter element. Now with the air box out of the way, we have a clearer look at how the air is going to travel through this resonator over here directly down to the turbocharger over here, which comes straight off the exhaust side. We've got our wastegate actuator over here, which is electronic. That turbocharged air is then going to be sent down to a pipe down below there, and then back up through this tube over here into the throttle body. I'm kind of surprised they don't put it through an intercooler in the front of the car. Back over on this side, we have a drive-by wire throttle body, and then the air intake plenum, which is made of plastic. Now when it comes to maintaining the oil the canister style oil filter is located over here you just put a giant socket on it and remove it over here is your oil fill cap and it takes zero w 20 weight oil now the one downside to bmws is they don't have a dipstick to check the oil you have to do it electronically with their oil sensor level down below now the oil filter location is always in a tight spot you got to remove these wires and you're going to make a mess when you get it out of here now looking at the ignition system you can see the quill packs are situated longitudinally over here so changing spark plugs shouldn't be too difficult now this has a direct injection fuel system here here you can see the fuel rail running along here and the four fuel injectors that go directly down into the combustion chamber. Over here you can see the high pressure fuel pump which is going to take fuel from the tank over there and use the camshaft's power in order to pressurize it before sending it down into the combustion chamber. Now one thing I don't like about this engine layout is the amount of wires and hoses that you'd have to remove in order to access critical components down below, especially when this engine gets older and these things get a little more brittle. It's really easy to crack and deform. I like it when they give you these pre-installed engine hooks because they know the engine's probably going to fail and you're going to need to use these hooks to pull it out. Now taking a look at the accessory belt drive in front here you can see most of it's kind of covered up by the shield here. The crankshaft is down below there and you can see that that's going to feed the alternator up at the top here and you've got a tensioner pulley down there you just put a socket on this and rotate it and you can get the drive belt off once you get all this other stuff out of the way. Now the cool thing about the alternator is that this ring that goes around it here makes it part of the tensioner so when you change the alternator the tensioner also comes out as well. And of course behind that drive belt is going to be a timing chain that's going to power the dual variable valve timing system. It's BMW's infamous Vano system which always gives trouble or causes leaks so you're going to have to cater for that down the road. Looking at all the electronics here you can see where the engine control module and the power distribution module are located. You just have a bunch of plugs here that you can easily remove if you want to change it. Now of course these headlights are all LED so if anything blows you're going to have to change the entire unit back here. There's no separate ballast that you can unbolt and change. Looking over here on the passenger side cowl we have a point here in case you need to boost the vehicle. If you unlock this cover over here see we have an auxiliary battery sitting underneath here. The real battery is probably buried under the trunk somewhere. Now the 3 series cooling system is going to be a little bit more complicated. We have one circuit for the turbocharger intercooler setup and the other circuit for the engine itself. You can see their respective reservoirs over there. Now the radiator is located on the shield at the front here. Now one cool thing I like is that you don't have to remove this entire front fascia in order to access the radiators or the radiator fans like many other vehicles. You just remove this shield over here and most of it just slides right up. And here's a look at the cooling fan setup up from behind here you can see you've got one giant plastic fan over here as opposed to a twin setup unit and it's motored down in the middle there behind that we do have the radiator of course there is a transmission cooler integrated at the bottom there and then your AC condenser now in front of the engine in and behind this water inlet here there is a belt driven mechanical water pump and that's going to power the cooling system inside the engine itself but there are two auxiliary water pumps for all of the other systems here you can see another water pump over here and then down over here there's another Another water pump that's electronically driven as well. These are all computer controlled according to the temperatures so you don't need no thermostat on those auxiliary circuits. Now there is however a thermostat on the side of the engine here integrated into a plastic water manifold. It's going to split these radiator hoses as well as the oil cooler down below the oil filter and the heater core hoses all together before it goes into the engine. Now speaking of cooling here you can see the radiator shutters. They're closed right now. 
and up at the top here in the kidney grills these are also closed as well that's to help with fuel economy aerodynamics and for it to warm up a little bit better in the cold here you can see the steering column shaft coming down over here towards the front of the engine over here and the steering rack itself is located down below here that's the steering EPS motor that's going to go across to the tie rods to turn the wheel now underneath this cover over here we can take a look at the braking system you can see the BMW is still using a vacuum brake booster as opposed to an electronically assisted brake boost which is good because it gives you better braking feel we've got our master cylinder over here with the brake lines that go out to it and a brake reservoir in order to breathe the blicks you can't really do it mechanically you have to hook up the vacuum tube and then open the bleeders down below and those brake lines on the master cylinder are going to come down to this ABS module over here more of a traditional style rather than an integrated brake module this is going to control all your traction control systems and autonomous braking features on this car now the exhaust setup is pretty straightforward we've got a single turbocharger on this engine over here and then it goes down to the catalytic converter down there and then below to a flex pipe down underneath the car at least BMW is giving you a nice flap over here to cover the wheel well area. A lot of other unibody cars leave this open and then a lot of dirt and mud kind of build up under this engine bay. It's also cool how you can see a distinct frame rail running to the front of the vehicle. Again, a lot of unibody cars kind of have it all integrated into the strut tower and into the body of the car. This is pretty distinct and you can see these little kinks in here for the crumple zones when you crash. It's kind of sad though that you bought a luxury car without any lining on the hood. At least these edges are not nearly as sharp as some other manufacturers like Ford. All right, so now that we're done under the hood, let's take a look underneath the vehicle to see what it's like down there. Taking a look under the three series, you can see everything is completely flat and covered up with either plastic or aluminum, which is a good thing for aerodynamics. You could tell that they've actually spent a little bit of money under here, but it's not really a good thing for me when I got to do maintenance because I got to take all this stuff off. And here's a look at the vehicle with those covers removed. You can see the inline four cylinder engine over here under this black foam and the transmission down at the back there. Now one thing I really appreciate is this fully boxed frame over here that's made of aluminum, which is good because it won't rust out, which is a common problem on a lot of vehicles. And the fact that it's fully boxed in, it's got this reinforcement over here and up at the front underneath here, which is really good for rigidity. A lot of other vehicles are just doing a single cross member over here to the wheels. Now starting up at the front here, here you can see the electronic power steering motor and the bottom of the radiator support. Now one thing I don't like is that there's no petcock valve here in order to drain any coolant you actually have to unplug the hoses from the radiator and make a giant mess in order to drain coolant on this car interesting fastener choice for the electronic power steering rack it's more of a spline type than a Torx. And here's where you'll notice where that EPS rack sits directly in front of the engine and is a front steer vehicle as opposed to the steering rack being behind the axle. Taking a look at the engine from underneath, I don't really like how they put this foam here to keep the engine warm. I feel like it's just going to absorb a lot of oil when this engine indefinitely is going to leak oil because it's a BMW. Coming around the back here, you can see the oil drain. There is a little pocket in the cover that sits here that allows you to access that without taking off all of these shields. If you spill oil while doing an oil drain, it's just going to soak up this carpet around here. Now taking a look at the exhaust here you can see the flex pipe that we saw from above that it goes down a fairly thick exhaust pipe down to the resonator down in the middle of the car and then to the muffler at the back. Now I understand how the exhaust is connected through this mount here to the engine before the flex pipe but the exhaust is also connected to the transmission over here after the flex pipe which doesn't really make sense. You would want to isolate this exhaust pipe from the moving drivetrain assembly by mounting it directly to the body instead of to the transmission. Now there's three main engine mounts. You got one over here on the driver's side and then one over here on the passenger side underneath the turbocharger and I do notice that none of these are active engine mounts. And the final engine mount is this one behind the tail shaft of the transmission that's going to mount it directly to the body and try to absorb some of that twisting torque when you accelerate. Now unlike the other side that has the turbocharger and the exhaust, the driver's side over here doesn't really have anything. It's just a big gaping hole. Here you have a closer look at the oil cooler. The oil filter would be further up. Then you've got the two lines here for the transmission cooler that go up to the front. And here's a look at the 8-speed automatic transmission on this engine. You can see it's got a plastic oil pan here and it also integrates the filter. So if you are changing the filter, you've also got to change the pan and the gasket all together. Here you can see there's a drain port and the fill port is located just at the top over here. Now there is no dipstick for this of course. You will have to do a fluid check procedure by making sure this is at the correct temperature and the excess oil will drain out. Now sitting just forward of the transmission in the bell housing is the starter assembly. Here's the power cable that goes to it over here. It's just hidden under this foam. Now, it shouldn't be too difficult to get out once you unbolt all this stuff. You slide it out this way 
and hopefully it'll clear the subframe and you don't have to drop it. Now this is a primarily rear wheel drive vehicle but it does have this transfer case here that feeds the X-Drive all wheel drive system and the prop shaft that's going to lead to the front wheels over here. Here you can see that prop shaft as it goes into the front differential. Now that front differential has axles that will go out to each wheel but because of its position it actually has to pass through the oil pan out to the passenger side and directly go out for the driver's side. And here's another look at that front differential. There is a fluid fill and a fluid drain port because it's got its own fluid. You can see it sort of sits towards the front of the engine but it is integrated into the oil pan. Here you got the axle that goes out to the front driver's wheel and the axle that goes out to the passenger wheel goes through the oil pan out to the other side. Now taking a look at the BMW 3 Series suspension setup here, it's a little unique. You've got a McPherson strut up at the top there that's taking the main load, but at the bottom here you do have a multi-link suspension. Now these bars here work in tension and compression with each their own integrated ball joint, which also means that these aluminum arms will need to be completely changed out when your ball joints do wear out because they are not a bolt-on or Preston style design. Now as these arms work in both tension and compression, you've got essentially two pivot points over here and that forms a virtual pivot point down in the middle here, which is supposedly going to give you a better steering axis inclination angle for better handling. You can see here those arms do join on to a press-on bushing over here and one over here on the subframe. Now as I said before, this vehicle is front steer. You get your inner and your outer tie rods over here, which is going to steer the steering knuckle. Now the knuckle itself is made of aluminum and if you look closely here, you'll see the bolts here that that are going to bolt on the bearing which means that you don't need a press to change it out when it does wear out. Now one thing a lot of people hate about BMWs is that you got the brake sensor that tells you when your brakes are worn out. This is the wire that tells you that but you can see it's actually chaving up on the sharp edge over here. This car's only got 700 kilometers on it and this wire is about to go. Taking a look at the suspension behind the wheel here, this is where I'm a little bit disappointed because they're using a McPherson strut design as opposed to like a double wishbone or a multi-link design at the top here. The older multi-link designs tend to give you better handling whereas the McPherson strut is kind of a budget option and that's where I think BMW did a little cost cutting on this platform. Now looking in and behind here you can see where that McPherson strut bolts up to the aluminum knuckle with just a pinch bolt. Here's a sway bar link that connects from the strut to the sway bar itself which is actually mounted forward of the axle in front of the steering rack and here we have our tension and compression rods down there. Taking a look at the front brakes here, you can see you've got a single piston caliper design here. Kind of a disappointment this being a premium car. You'd expect at least a dual piston or a four pot caliper, but I guess they saved that for the M Sport models. Now if you think of some of the car's Japanese competitors such as the Infiniti Q50, Acura TLX, Lexus IS, they all use a double wishbone suspension and offer more pistons on their calipers, even on the base models, which is kind of disappointing because BMW was once known for their performance and driver oriented design as opposed of this economy car stuff. Now underneath the back of the vehicle here you can see the rest of the exhaust as it comes up to the back here and leads to the mufflers. Now they did spend a little bit more money on the exhaust by making it this really nice shape, hydroformed, as opposed to just taking tube steel and cutting it and welding it together. And here's a look at the transversely muffler mounted from the back here. You can see the primary outlet is this one coming out of the driver's side here. Then on the passenger side we've got a little actuator here that's going to enable that side to work when you need more airflow or more noise kind of looks like a little throttle body when you look down that pipe. Looking at the rear differential, you can see that the drive shaft actually runs above the exhaust over here down the middle of the car. One thing I don't like about this differential is that there's only a fill port, which means that you actually have to use a suction tube to go in there to remove the old fluid and then pump in new fluid until it spills over. They could have just made a proper drain on the bottom with a magnet so it catches any particles and that way you could tell the health of your differential. And the gas tank over here is made of plastic, which is a good thing because it won't rot out. Now just above the exhaust is that bright red cable, which is going to take the 12 volts from your your trunk mounted battery all the way to the front of the vehicle. A little hard to see but behind this rear quarter is where your EVAP canister is located. Taking a look at the rear suspension things are a little bit more disappointing starting first with this subframe they went with a stab steel design as opposed to the aluminum like they did in the front. In addition they've also gone with stamp steel control arm this uses a five link multi-link setup over here you can see we've got one of the control arms here this one here is the bed pan control arm it takes the weight of the spring up at the top here it's got this aero panel on the bottom here and that connects up to the subframe here. We've got another link over here. And looking up at the top here, you can see we've got a link on the right side and another link on the left side. 
And they all have that slender C-shaped stamped steel design to try to save weight, but they're also trying to save cost by not going with aluminum. Looking at the knuckle from the back here, it is made of aluminum to save weight. You can see the axle goes in and you can barely make out the bolts that hold the hub on. However, the BMW service manual wants you to replace the entire knuckle as opposed to just pressing out or bolting on a new bearing. Looking at the rear brakes from behind, you can see this here is the electric parking brake motor. Now you will need some kind of special tool or maybe a paper clip to disable that before doing a rear brake job on one of these. And this flimsy little link over here is your ride height sensors to tell the headlights to point up or down depending on if you're on a grade. And here's a look at the rear suspension from the wheel well. You can see these top links here joined to the knuckle. Now it looks like all of these links here join at the knuckle here using bushings. There actually is no ball joints here that'll wear out just rubber bushing. Now the rear sway bar link is made of plastic and you can see how that sway bar is going to go over to the other side and join up with the subframe. Now replacing rear shocks on one of these is pretty straightforward. You just got two bolts at the top there and then one bolt down on the control arm over here and it should be easy to change out especially if you don't have the adaptive variable suspension. I kind of wish they did a better job of protecting this junction box and all these wires and hoses and the gasoline fill from any debris flinging up from the rear wheel here. Now the rear brakes are pretty straightforward with a single piston floating caliper design but it actually looks like the diameter of the disc itself is almost the same size as the front. Now, what I really think is cool is they've got this nice curved design here which you don't see on many other cars. It kind of reminds me of the shape of a torque converter. And now we're going to have a listen to the engine. And that's a wrap on the mechanicals of the BMW 330i. Now in all honesty, this vehicle is not nearly as scary as I thought it would be with the exception of some extra hoses under the hood and some cheapness in the suspension design. However, this being a BMW, I can't really recommend it as a long-term purchase, especially without a warranty. Even if the engine and the transmission are reliable, the rest of the car starts falling apart and it costs a lot of money to fix. Now you tell me in the comment section down below, what do you think of the BMW 3 Series or any vehicle with the B48 engine? Has it been reliable? And how has it been holding up over time? And make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one. Oh crap.